Number five, DB Cooper. One of the most infamous disappearance cases in history, and I'm gonna be honest, probably my personal favorite unsolved mystery of all time. If you haven't heard the story of the real life daredevil heister, Mr. DB Cooper, you're in for a treat and then some. Depending on your definition of success, you could argue D.B. Cooper might be the most successful criminal in history, since not only did he get off with quite an impressive take, but he got away with all his crimes and avoided capture, if he's still alive, that is. On November 24th, 1971, a man using an alias of Dan Cooper walked up to the ticket counter at Portland International and booked a one-way ticket to Seattle, claiming that he was on business. He was technically correct in that assessment. Once on board the plane, Cooper passed a note to a flight attendant, and he was not asking for an extra bag of peanuts and fluffing his pillow. No, he was just letting the attendant know that he had brought a bomb on board the flight and demanded $200,000 and four parachutes. And if he caught a whiff of any funny business, he'd turn this plane into a national tragedy on the six o'clock news, see? So, you know, nothing unreasonable, really. I make all those demands whenever I'm hangry. Pretty normal stuff. So the plane landed in Seattle, as originally plant and authorities were summoned to deliver the ransom money and parachutes to Cooper. The passengers were relieved and eventually let go, but the flight crew was stuck with their new boss, Mr. Cooper, who'd taken them hostage. Cooper seized the plane, planning a flight path to Mexico City, but midway through the flight, Cooper, who was a huge fan of the film Point Break and wanted to pay homage to it, jumped out of a plane with all of the money. D.B. Cooper jumping out of that plane with a suitcase full of money would be the last time anyone ever saw him. He jumped out of that plane and into the stuff of history book legends, the hall of fame of heisters. Move over payday crew, this guy's got you beat. Despite extensive searching, not a hair of D.B. Cooper ever turned up. Some speculate, rather bluntly, that perhaps he miscalculated the angle and splattered somewhere across the Northwest and the heist wasn't as impressive as we thought, while others imagined that he got off easy, he's knocking back Mai Tais on a Hawaiian island, enjoying the spoils of his loot. But who was the guy to begin with? A career crook on one last job? Someone trying it out? Someone snapping? Several theories suggest he was ex-military, special forces, which would explain his proficiency. In fact, the leading hypothesis is that he was ex-military. We may never know who the real D.B. Cooper is, and that's fine. That's the way he'd want it. And if we don't know who he is, it makes it that much more fun for us. He could be any one of us. He could be you. He could be me. He could be... Oh, I'll stop talking there. And if you're looking for more scary videos and strange stories out there, we've got all of that and then some. If you can think it up, we've probably done a video or two on it. We've got quite the catalog. So click on through, hit subscribe, and please tickle that little bell and make sure you don't miss a single screen. But would you kindly do that at the end of this video? Because I got four more missing persons cases ready for you now. Number four, the Mary Celeste. Our next mysterious case is a bit of an outlier, a little bit of a cheat. I know, I know. It's not just one person going going missing, it's an entire ship. How does that happen? December 1872, the captain of the Mary Celeste, one Benjamin Briggs, cast off to New York to travel to Italy for unknown reasons, but probably for the tomatoes. The ship was kept to a rather tight crew. A staff of eight, plus Briggs' wife and daughter, were enough to man the vessel. The voyage seemed like it went pretty well until another vessel, the Del Gradia, came into contact with the Celeste and were chilled at what they'd found when they recovered the ship drifting aimlessly. As rescuers boarded the ship, they were greeted with a maritime mystery to forever haunt them. The ship seemed to be in perfect working order. No signs of damage or distress. Had it not been found freely floating, they'd assume the ship was just built. Aside from a single lifeboat missing, the ship was in good condition. The holds stocked with food and water. The crew's personal belongings were scattered about. The table was set for a meal, as if the crew had been minutes away from breaking bread. So what happened? What reasonable captain would abandon a perfectly serviceable well-stocked ship? While reasonable explanations were offered, theories of 
piracy or mutiny prevailing. Now, the ship being relatively untouched does call into question the notion of piracy as I don't know how much you know about pirates, but they didn't tend to leave the rum behind if there is any. Any pirate captain worth his salt would have plundered that thing down to the floorboards. And there didn't appear to be any struggle at all, so no forceful evacuation, nobody kicked them off the ship. So with rationale out of the way, we've nowhere left to turn but blind and wild speculation. Theories of supernatural beings, cursed gold, vengeful spirits, sea monsters, Davy Jones. Take your pick of whatever nautical bedtime story you think could have overtaken the Mary Celeste. So you know what, let me know down below. I love pirate ghost stories more than anything. Perhaps it was a bit of sea madness? Cabin fever? Maybe it's whatever happened to those two guys in the lighthouse happened to them here? No matter how you slice it, the vanishing of the Mary Celeste is a head scratcher of a mystery. More lost souls to the darkness that lurks below the ocean's water. Wary yourselves against the whispers that echo the seas, for the spirits of the Mary Celeste may still be watching, eager to claim another. Number three, Frederick Valentich. Our next mysterious case is Frederick Valentich, an Australian pilot, a well trained aerial ace. He had 150 hours of man flight experience and was permitted to fly alone, provided it was in good weather conditions. He also had a love of extraterrestrial terrestrial life a deep desire to find that unknown above. Well, Valentich might have got his wish. Tragically, it might have cost him his life. The year was 1978. Frederick Valentich was performing a 125 nautical mile training flight flying to a small landmass called Kings Island. While at 4,500 feet in the air, Valentich thought he had seen something with him. The Melbourne Flight Service insisted that there wasn't anything in the air with him, but Frederick radioed back and said that there was something on his tail. He claimed that he saw something glowing with four repeating bright lights and was rushing past him, and he described it as shiny, metallic, and chrome and looking like like a small manned craft. Now, unsure what was happening, Valentich on radio to ground control told them that he was experiencing engine troubles inexplicably. Could this strange flying object be the source of these unexpected problems? Valentich complained out about whatever was following him to the Melbourne Flight Service, saying, It's hovering and it's not an aircraft. Those would be the last words anyone ever heard from Frederick. Minutes after that last transmission, he went silent and the plane or the mysterious craft was never found. An intense search revealed nothing. No sign of the man. The only lead was a local farmer alleging that the day Frederick disappeared, he saw what looked like a civilian aircraft seemingly fused with what looked like a saucer. The farmer told authorities he was worried about being dismissed as a crackpot, so he didn't tell anyone what he saw that day. What do you think? Should he have checked his eyes better? Or was he perhaps the last person to see the remnant of Frederick Valentich before he was carried off into who knows what? Number two, Michael Rockefeller. When Michael Rockefeller was born, he was born with a silver spoon to a lineage of millionaires in the late 1930s. His great grandfather, one John Rockefeller, is one of the richest men to have ever lived. The Rockefellers had hoped that Michael would follow them in the family business. Michael, however, had other ideas and wanted to use his millions of dollars to goof off and take it easy, which is what most of us would, I think. Michael had wanderlust in his heart and a deep interest in anthropology, specifically focused on Nigerian, Mayan, and Aztec cultures. Michael's father sat on a board of a museum in New York where Michael would discover this passion, hoping to one day open a collection of indigenous art in New York. After some discussions with the Dutch Museum of Ethnology, terrible name, Michael had decided he would set out to the massive island off the coast of Australia at the time known as Dutch New Guinea. In 1961, he set off to collect the art of the Azmat people who lived there. It would be a one-way trip. The Azmat people that he was going to study were very disconnected from the rest of the world. They had previously seen Dutch colonizers, but otherwise they weren't getting a ton of visitors. The Azmat believed that the land beyond their island was inhabited by spirits, and they saw the Euros and the Americans as supernatural beings that had come over from across the sea. Michael and his team were allowed to study the people, but were banned from purchasing or taking anything, which held a great deal of significance to the Azmat. Nonetheless, Michael was thrilled with everything he'd been finding and could not wait to open his exhibit. In November 1961, Michael was on a boat accompanied by other anthropologists when a sudden squall threw the boat off its course. 
12 miles away from the shore, but Michael insisted he could swim for it, and he was never seen again. The Rockefellers would spend the next few months spending a small fortune trying to find Michael, but gave up after never uncovering anything. The case went cold for years, but officers believed that Michael hadn't been lost to the water, but was rather offered as part of a sacrifice. His head chopped off, his flesh eaten, his bones made into weaponry, you know. Fun stuff. An investigator, one Carl Hoffman, uncovered this while filming the Asmat people. He saw a group of men acting out a scene, miming the act of, um, removing someone's head from the rest of their neck and attacking them with spears. Now, we can't really find this footage, but through interpretation and translation was a stern warning to the other villagers that Hoffman reported. Pop your ears open and take a listen. Don't you tell this story to any other man. I hope you remember it and you must keep this for us. I hope this is for you and you only. Don't talk to anyone, to other people, or another village. If people question you, don't answer. Don't talk to them because the story is only for you. If you tell it to them, you'll die. Or any other village because the story is only for us. I, I, probably, I probably shouldn't have shared it just then, now. Maybe just scrub that. Number one, Lars Mittank. Lars Mittank is a young German man who became infamous in 2014 when his disappearance captured the attention of the world. Last seen on airport security footage, he's been called the most famous missing person on YouTube. Wow, isn't that a lovely title? I'd put that right on my resume. In July 2014, Mitank was vacationing in Varna, Bulgaria, I've heard lovely things, with a group of friends. Apparently things were pretty unremarkable until an argument about football at a bar turned into a brawl. You see, Mitank was a Bremen man and he was getting into an argument with some nasty Bayern fans. I actually don't know nothing about German football. Clear that up in the comments. Mitank would suffer a ruptured eardrum and was told to stay on the ground for flying could damage his ears even further. So Lars decided to stay in Varna just a little bit longer while the rest of the party would return back to Berlin. Now here's where things take a turn for the strange. CCTV footage from the airport shows Lars behaving strangely, for lack of a better word. Dropping his luggage, running in a sprint, hopping a fence, the kind of things you would do if you were running away from somebody. His final texts warned his mother to cancel his credit cards as he believed he was being pursued. This footage was the last time he was ever seen as he vanished without a trace shortly thereafter. Both German and Bulgarian authorities launched investigations, but nobody found anything. Hospital records turned up nothing. And outside of a few disconnected sightings of alleged hitchhikers, which could have matched descriptions, nothing was ever outright confirmed. So what happened? <laughs> what happened? There are theories. Some speculate perhaps that the medication he was prescribed was causing a psychological breakdown, combined with the paranoia being attacked and reeling from the attack earlier in the week. The doctor who prescribed that medication, though, noted he never even filed the prescription. And the doctor was perplexed and concerned with the seemingly causeless change of behavior. Number five, hit and run. A hit and run is probably in the top five lamest things that can happen to you. Simpsons hit and run, however, fantastic. Someone hits your car and then doesn't have the decency to pull over and check in on what's wrong. Even more frustrating is to know that you'll probably never get to find out who did it unless you have the army of the internet on your side. A Reddit user named Meat Headed had experienced a hit and run and frustrated and at a loss, turned to Reddit to try and find some answers with what little evidence he had to offer. When he posted a picture of a broken headlight to r slash what is this thing? He probably didn't expect as much of a response as he got as it was kind of an odd question. But some 400 comments later, and Redditors had managed to accurately find the model of the car down to the make, model, and year, and all of this just off of a bit of broken plastic and glass. Meatheaded then took the information and ran it through a database and found a 91 gray Cadillac that had been reported stolen. Meatheaded sent the data over to the traffic crimes unit of his local police department and were able to corroborate the data to track down the missing car and the suspect. Again, all just on a blurry photo of a broken headlight, which is downright incredible. Not only did they manage to find the car, but they also managed to connect it to a theft, busting two crimes with one post. Most Reddit posts don't get nearly that lucky. At most, you're getting a few upvotes, not solving a crime. And if you've got a love for scary videos, my friends, let us know. Subscribe to catch more of them every day, twice a day. Let's keep going. Number four, phone scam. Now, not every crime has to be a grim one. Sometimes it's as simple as helping somebody get out of a scam. In 2019, an anonymous Redditor posted a complaint to the Reddit Bureau of Investigation subreddit complaining that he had been scammed while trying to sell his phone privately. The Redditor had been in a bad situation in dire straits, needed some quick cash, and was selling off an old phone to someone he'd met on a local listing site like Craigslist. He met the customer who asked to meet late at night, not thinking too much of it, the Redditor obliged, 
only to have his phone swiped quickly and when he noticed the money he'd been given, he'd noticed that it was all counterfeit bills. Frustrated and scammed, he was helpless with no idea what to do. A Redditor reached out to the original poster and helped them track the number that he was given to contact the scammer. They searched through and found that it belonged to a 75 year old man who didn't quite add up. So they did some more digging and they found that the man who owned the phone number had one relative who happened to share a name with the scanner. Through more digging, the OP and Reddit discovered that the man had been arrested previously and had a suspended driver's license. Kind of amusingly, the original poster went back to the police with all this new information and discovered that the detectives had copied down the numbers of the scammer down completely wrong, so they were never going to be any help at all. Two days later, they called him into the station to look at a lineup and they'd found the phone scammer. His grandfather had been paying it off and the relative he'd been looking into was the scammer's father. The detectives thanked him for his time and they charged him with criminal fraud with the intent to deceive. The OP got it solved, he got the phone back, and the scammer got charged. And you got to hear about this story in this lovely video. So win, win, win. Number three, hit and run again. In August of 2018, a woman went out for a bike ride and tragically was struck fatally during a hit and run accident. There was nothing to tie a perpetrator to the scene, no cameras, no footage, no security footage. The only evidence that the police had found was a small black fragment of the vehicle that had struck the bicycle, but it looked indescribable. Not knowing what else to do, Washington State Troopers tweeted out a picture of the fragment in a desperate attempt that maybe the internet's collective hive mind might be able to help them identify anything since, well, they were plumb out of ideas. The post eventually made its way to Reddit, posting to r slash what is this thing, and we know from a couple minutes earlier in this video that r slash what is this thing is really good at identifying random car parts left behind at the scenes of hit and runs. Well, lo and behold, the Reddit intelligence once again took care of the impossible, and within a while, the unlikely hero named Jess Nuts posted that it was part of a headlamp of an 88 Chevy Silverado. The Redditor clarified that he was a Maryland State Inspector for years, and part of each of his inspection process was a mandatory headlamp adjustment. So he explained that he has seen a lot of headlamps in his time, and immediately recognized what part of the car it should have belonged to. With this tip in hand, it was only a few days later, on August 14th, 2018, where the state troopers tweeted out that they were able to make an arrest after Reddit users identified the broken car part, leading them to the driver who was swiftly apprehended. The driver had been driving very tired, allegedly, and didn't look back after he'd hit someone because he didn't want to see a body. Not really a great excuse. He was sentenced to four years. It may not provide all the closure for the family, but thanks to the help of some Reddit detectives, the case was able to be closed and some justice was able to be served. Number two, Jane Doe. In 2014, Reddit user Call Me Ice shared a story about an unidentified set of bones lying in a cemetery in Strongsville, Ohio. The user was researching another cold case at the time, amusingly, and was searching for genealogy records and came across the unidentified skeleton and became very intrigued by the mystery. Why was there never an effort in over 40 years to make an identification as to who these bones belong to? Wishing to right a wrong, Call Me Ice posted to r slash unresolved mysteries in the hopes of getting some resolved mysteries. The Strongsville Jane Doe, as she was known, was first found in 1975 by three boys who were exploring a nearby forest. They found a skeleton lying on a sandbar, mostly intact, but missing some of its jaw. Naturally, the bones were reported, and it was thought to belong to a woman estimated aged 18 to 25, who had suffered a fatal gunshot approximately five months before being discovered. Detectives at the time checked her across several missing women cases, but were unable to make any connections or draw up any significant evidence. And the trail went completely cold for decades. Until 2014, when Call Me Ice started to look into it. Call Me Ice got in touch with the cemetery and managed to get access to the original autopsy files and a photo of the skull. She sent it over to a digital reconstruction artist, who then made it up a mock-up. Now nothing too much happened for a while, until in 2016, the forensic artist who had done the reconstruction came across a listing on the NAMIS website, that's the National Missing and Unidentified Persons System, of a woman named Linda Pagano, 
who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances around 1974. She'd come home from a concert and gotten into an argument with her stepfather and supposedly left to go visit her mother, where she was never seen again after. The forensic artist then contacted the medical examiner's office and pulled Linda's dental records, and wouldn't you know it, she matched the Strongsville Jane Doe to Linda Pagano. Although the identity of the attacker was never found, the family was able to find the smallest closure in finally knowing what happened to Linda Pagano, and it never would have happened without a Redditor bringing it back up. Number 1. The Grateful Doe and One of the more notable examples of Reddit solving a cold case was a 20 year mystery as to identify the body recovered from a car crash that was too damaged to be identified. In 1995, a Volkswagen van was found crashed into the trees off of a highway in Virginia. The driver was able to be identified, but his passenger unfortunately wasn't. A pair of Grateful Dead tickets in his pocket led to him being dubbed the Grateful Doe as a pseudonym. For 20 tragic years, the man was never identified and the case was completely cold with nary so much as a link until a redditor caught wind of the case and was intrigued by it and opened it back up herself the user then made a subreddit specifically for this case called r slash grateful doe and suddenly there was all this renewed interest from the greater collective of people working pro bono to try and find any connections they could digital reconstructions of the face composite sketches all this Eventually, this caught the attention of someone who was sent an image of one of the composite sketches and said that it looked identical to his old roommate. After getting in contact with the roommate, he pointed the subreddit into the right direction, saying that the Grateful Doe's name, he thought, was Jason Callahan. Reddit then tracked down Shannon Callahan, Jason's half-sister, who upon seeing the composite sketch was moved and offered to take a DNA test. The DNA test confirmed everyone's hypothesis and after two decades, an ice cold case with absolutely no leads was able to be closed and Jason's family finally got a little bit of relief to know what happened to their missing relative. The subreddit Grateful Doe is still active and now serves as a hub for several other cold missing cases with others frequently being solved every day. Number five, take care of Maya. Intriguingly, there exists a profound intersection between the realms of documentary filmmaking and legal proceedings that begs our scrutiny today. Strap in because this narrative is a whirlwind of ethical quandaries, societal introspection, and the power of media. And while I hate to see ethical wrongs per se, I just love a good ethics debate. Take Care of Maya is a documentary that made waves across multiple dimensions. Its genesis lay in the profound story of Maya, a young woman caught in the throes of addiction, homelessness, and an unforgiving urban environment. This documentary, often called a social experiment, had a filmmaker become an active participant in Maya's life, providing her with shelter, emotional support, and financial resources. The resulting ethical questions are positively puzzling. The documentary's ethical maelstrom primarily revolves around the observer effect and the undeniable impact of the filmmaker's presence on Maya's life. As viewers, we grapple with the question, can true unbiased observation exist when the observer influences the observed? This documentary exposes the inherent subjectivity of all filmmaking, challenging us to reconsider the objective lens we often presume documentaries to be. The filmmaker's role, ethically fraught as it may be, cannot overshadow the stark reality it showcases. Take Care of Maya thrusts homelessness and addiction into the limelight, forcing society to confront the uncomfortable truth that millions face Daily. It fosters empathy by humanizing Maya's struggle and painting a vivid picture of the complex web of circumstances that lead to homelessness. Yet, as compelling as this documentary may be, it wasn't merely, you know, a cinematic endeavor. It has since morphed into a legal battleground, a lawsuit reminiscent of, you know, a courtroom drama has recently ensued. Maya alleged that the filmmaker, by intervening so significantly in her life, had effectively manipulated her and exploited her vulnerable state. Her case posed critical questions about, you know, consent agency, and the blurred lines between documentary artistry and, you know, personal responsibility, Maya's trial teeters on the precipice of a broader legal and ethical debate. Where do we draw the line between, you know, documentary storytelling and ethical boundaries? Does the power dynamic shift when the subject is in a vulnerable state, and should documentarians be held accountable for their subject's welfare? These questions resonate deeply with the legal community and, you know, the broader public, provoking conversations about the duty of care inherent in documentary filmmaking. Now, this case is not an isolated incident. Incident. It echoes concerns in an era where media is increasingly intertwined with reality. The boundaries between reality TV, documentary filmmaking, and personal intervention have blurred, often at the expense of ethics and the subjects involved. The Take Care of Maya trial acts as a cautionary tale for content creators.
leaders, emphasizing the profound responsibility they bear when delving into the lives of their subjects. The Take Care of Maya documentary and the currently ongoing trial are a mesmerizing case study in the complex interplay between, once again, documentary filmmaking, ethics, and the law. It forces us to confront our assumptions about objectivity in the media, the power of storytelling, and, you know, the ethical dilemmas that arise when documenting vulnerable lives. The documentary may have concluded, but the conversations that sparked continue to reverberate in our society, reminding us that the pursuit of truth and artistry is kind of fraught with moral complexities. I know I'll be following the case super closely myself. Number 4. Crime Scene – The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel So imagine a hotel with a dark history, a place where unsettling mysteries seem to linger in the very air you breathe. Now take that premise and add a dash of true crime intrigue, and you get Crime Scene – The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, a docu-series that will keep you riveted from start to finish. The Cecil Hotel, nestled in the heart of downtown Los Angeles, isn't exactly your typical accommodation. It's a place that has seen its fair share of tragedy and inexplicable events over the years. Cited as one of the inspirations for American Horror Story Hotel, its history includes multiple deaths by a single hand and more unexplainable horrors. In Crime Scene, the hotel itself becomes a central character, its eerie ambiance seeping into every frame. But what sets this documentary apart is its relentless pursuit of the truth. It unravels the perplexing disappearance of Elisa Lam, a young Canadian tourist who checked into the Cecil and then seemingly vanished into thin air. The story unfolds like a finely crafted mystery novel, with each episode peeling back a layer of intrigue. Director Joe Berlinger masterfully weaves together interviews, surveillance footage, and reenactments to create a narrative that is as haunting as it is captivating. The documentary immerses you into the world of amateur sleuths and internet detectives who are drawn into the enigma of Elisa's disappearance, adding a layer of meta narrative that is both fascinating and unsettling. Crime Scene also delves into the power of online communities and the phenomenon of armchair investigations. It's a reflection of our modern age, where the line between the virtual and the real kind of blurs, and the collective wisdom of the internet can both illuminate and obscure the truth. Which tends to be something that scares the daylights out of me on a regular basis. But it's not just about the mystery. Crime Scene peels back the layers of the Cecil Hotel's history, unearthing a disturbing past that includes notorious guests like Richard Ramirez, you know, the infamous Night Stalker? What's truly compelling about this documentary is its ability to make you question everything. It's a deep dive into the human psyche, exploring the complexities of mental health, the impact of urban environments, and the unsettling power of coincidence. It forces you to confront your own biases and assumptions, reminding you that the truth is often far more elusive than it appears. In the realm of true crime documentaries, Crime Scene – The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel stands as a testament to the genre's ability to captivate, challenge, and disturb. It's a journey into the heart of darkness. A tantalizing puzzle that will keep you guessing until the very end. So, you know, if you're in search of a really good Netflix true crime documentary that will leave you both, you know, enthralled and unsettled, this one should be on everybody's list. It's right up my alley. Number three, Icarus. Honestly, the comparisons that can be made in the name alone are originally what drew me to the title of the stock, but when I dug deeper into its content, I just knew I had to include it on today's list. So Icarus is a documentary that begins as a personal experiment and metamorphoses into an international espionage thriller. The film is an astonishing voyage into the dark heart of the Russian state-sponsored doping scandal. This is totally my personal bias speaking, but it's just such a fascinating scandal to me. Ryan Fogel, our intrepid filmmaker and cyclist, embarked on a quest to explore the world of doping in sports, particularly cycling. Yeah, I wonder why. He intended to prove that, you know, with the right doping regimen, he could evade detection and compete in the Haute Route, one of the toughest amateur races. So enter Dr. Grigory Rodenchukov. I tried. The former head of Russia's anti-doping laboratory. He's the linchpin of the story, a whistleblower with an incredible tale to tell. What unfolds is an international web of deception, state-sponsored cheating, and geopolitical intrigue. Grigory's revelations expose a meticulously orchestrated doping program that implicates not just athletes, but also the highest echelons of the Russian government. Icarus takes us on a roller coaster ride through the intricacies of the World Anti-Doping Agency, or WADA for short, the International Olympic Committee, and the crazy world of Russian sports politics. Vogel's accidental transformation from cyclist to investigative journalist thrusts him into a whirlwind of events that would seem far-fetched if they weren't chillingly real. The film becomes a tense thriller as Rodenchikov's life in jeopardy. And um, 
Vogel grapples with the ethical dilemma of protecting his source. It's a fascinating exploration of the moral quagmire faced by whistleblowers and journalists in the pursuit of truth. The stakes could be higher, as Rogenkov's revelations could dismantle the entire Russian Olympic team. Icarus is a jaw-dropping testament to the power of documentary filmmaking. It takes us behind the curtain of international sports, revealing a world where winning at any cost is the mantra. It forces us to question the integrity of the sports we hold dear, challenging our belief in fair competition. The documentary's impact reverberates far beyond the screen, leading to significant consequences for Russian athletes and the world of sports governance. As the credits roll, Icarus leaves us with a profound sense of unease and skepticism. It's a stark reminder that the pursuit of glory can sometimes lead to a descent into darkness. The film is a testament to the importance of transparency, accountability, and the enduring battle against cheating in sports. Number two, athlete X. Alrighty folks, fair warning, this one involves some icky um, schmexual allegations, so I promise I won't mind if you jump away for a moment. Athlete A thrusts us into the heart of a scandal that rocked the world of gymnastics. This documentary, directed by Bonnie Cohen and John Shank, unfurls the harrowing story of Larry Nassar, a former USA gymnastics team doctor and the brave survivors who exposed his decades-long schmexual wrongdoings. The narrative unfolds like a suspenseful legal drama, punctuated by interviews with the survivors, journalists, and the investigative team from the Indianapolis star. It's a harrowing tale of torment, betrayal, and the incredible spirit of young gymnasts determined to seek justice. What sets Athlete A apart from other documentaries is its unflinching focus on the survivors' voices. Their courage in speaking out against a powerful institution and a trusted doctor is both heartbreaking and inspiring. The documentary explores the toxic culture of elite gymnastics, where young athletes are often silenced and pushed to their limits. The film also raises important questions about accountability. How did Larry's wrongdoings go unchecked for so long? Who knew or should have known about the harm he caused? Athlete A forces us to confront these uncomfortable truths and challenges us to reevaluate the power dynamics in sports organizations. But it's not just a story of darkness, it's also a tale of resilience and change. The survivors' testimonies and the investigative journalism that exposed Larry's crime ultimately lead to his conviction. It's a testament to the importance of investigative reporting and the impact it can have on society. As we watch Athlete A, we are left with a profound sense of the enduring strength of the human spirit. It's a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable trauma, survivors can find their voice and spark change. The documentary serves as a call to action, urging us to protect young athletes and create safer environments in sports. In the realm of true crime documentaries, Athlete A stands as a powerful and necessary exploration of taking advantage of being in a position of power, justice, and the resilience of survivors. It's not just a film, it's a reckoning with the past and a plea for a better future. Number one, keep sweet, pray and obey. Alrighty, one of my favorite, least favorite things. Cults. This documentary is a chilling deep dive into the secretive and haunting world of the FLDS, or the Fundamentalist Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which is a heck of a mouthful. It takes us on a journey into the heart of a religious sect that's shrouded in mystery, manipulation, and fear. At its core, Keep Sweet is an exploration of the power dynamics within the FLDS community. We're introduced to the notorious Warren Jeffs, the self-proclaimed prophet who wielded absolute authority over his followers. Through interviews with former members, we gain insight into the cult like control exerted by Jeffs and the devastating consequences it had on families and individuals. The documentary peels back the layers of secrecy that have long surrounded the FLDS, exploring the horrors that festered behind closed doors. It's a stark reminder of the dangers of blind faith and the devastating impact of religious extremism. What's particularly striking about Keep Sweet is its exploration of the psychological manipulation that occurs within cults. We see how Jeffs used religion as a weapon to control every aspect of his father's lives, from their marriages to their clothing choices. It raises profound questions about the boundaries between religious freedom and coercion. The film also delves into the courageous efforts of those who escaped the FLDS and fought for justice. Their stories are a testament to the resilience of the human spirit and the power of truth to overcome indoctrination. Keep Sweet is not just a true crime documentary, it's a story of survival and the pursuit of freedom. As viewers were left with a haunting question, how can individuals be so deeply ensnared by a charismatic leader that they willingly surrender their autonomy and critical thinking? Keep Sweet challenges us to examine the psychology of manipulation and the allure of belonging to a community, even when it comes at a steep price. In the true crime you know, documentary landscape, Keep Sweet is a gripping and sobering exploration of religious extremism and the resilience of the human spirit. It's a stark reminder that even in the darkest corners of society, there are those who dare to defy and seek the light of truth. And that brings us to the end of our time, and I can't wait to watch even more documentaries when I get home tonight. Alrighty folks, I'm gonna kick this off with less of a mystery and more of a crime from the 90s in the name of the occult that hurt my brain. Yeah, it's probably more recent than expected, but bear with me here. 
Welcome to the dark and twisted world of the Beasts of Satan, a name that echoes not just a criminal group, but a haunting chapter in the tales of occult mysteries from history. See, I like a good rhyme. The sinister saga unfolds like a macabre symphony, blending elements of satanic rituals, heavy metal music, and gruesome killings in a chilling crescendo that gripped Italy from 1998 until 2004. It all began with the red-soaked canvas of a double homicide in the woods near Soma Lombardo, a locale that would later be stained with more tales of horror. Chiara Marino and Fabio Tolis, a young couple immersed in the metal subculture, were sacrificed in a substance-fueled occult rite, marking the inception of a series of satanic ritual killings. The perpetrators, including names like Andrea Volpe, Nicola Sapone, and Mario Maccione, were not merely acquaintances. They were friends who turned into agents of the malevolence. The initial investigation stumbled, attributing the disappearance of the couple to a love affair gone awry. However, Fabio Tolis's father, Michel Tolis, embarked on a personal quest to unravel the truth. His persistence revealed a nexus between Satanism, the occult, and the black and death metal genres that his son and friends were drawn to. The story takes a darker turn with the third killing in 2004, involving Mariangela Pizzotta, a former girlfriend of Andrea Volpe. The details are gruesome, and she was fired at, mutilated, and buried alive in a greenhouse. The crimes were not just about death, but a perverse dance with it, marked by addiction and substance-fueled madness. As the investigation progressed, the abyss widened, revealing potential connections to other unsolved cases. The alleged involvement of the beasts of Satan in up to 14 other mysterious deaths, including self-inflicted ones, disappearances, and violent incidents, cast a shadow of terror over the entire situation. The trials that followed saw convictions, but the reactions were kind of mixed. The sentence seemed inadequate to some, while others found solace in the semblance of justice. Life imprisonment awaited the leader, Nicolas Sapone, while others faced long terms behind bars. The aftermath of this dark chapter extended beyond prison walls. Concerns about Satanism's allure amongst Italian youth grew, prompting calls for bans on death metal music. The revelations led to the establishment of a specialized police unit focused on investigating new religious sects and ritualistic groups, signaling a societal response to the fear that gripped the nation. Okay, so this next situation is less so a mystery, but another historical occult crime that I can't go without mentioning today. If Aleister Crowley isn't the first person that pops into your brain when you think about occult wrongdoings in history, I'd like to know who is. Born in 1875, Aleister Crowley was one of the most notorious occultists in the modern era. He had a rebellious youth when he joined the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, where he was trained in ceremonial magic by Samuel Adele McGregor Mathers and Alan Bennett. He went mountaineering in Mexico with Oscar Eckenstein for studying Hindu and Buddhist practices practices in India. In 1904, he married Rose Edith Kelly and they honeymooned in Cairo, Egypt, where Crowley claimed to have been contacted by a supernatural entity named Iwas, who provided him with the Book of the Law, a sacred text that served as the basement for the Lama, a traveler who loved the mountains. Alistair sought the most extreme and obscure forms of magic. In 1900, he attempted the Abramelin ritual, which required six months to complete and allegedly gave him control over the 12 Lords of Hell. However, he abandoned the ritual before completing it, which I don't blame him. Six months is a long time. So he then founded his own religion, Thelema, identifying himself as the prophet entrusted with guiding humanity. After the unsuccessful 1905 Kachinjunga expedition and a visit to India and China, Alistair returned to Britain, where he attracted attention as a prolific author of poetry, novels, and occult literature. In 1907, he and George Cecil Jones co-founded an esoteric order, through which they propagated Thelema. After spending time in Algeria, in 1912, Alistair was initiated into another esoteric order, the German-based Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO for short, rising to become the leader of its British branch, which he reformulated in accordance with his personal beliefs. Through the OTO, Thelemite groups were established in Britain, Australia, and North America. Alistair spent the First World War in the United States, where he took up painting and campaigned for the German war effort against Britain, later revealing that he had infiltrated the pro-German movement to assist the British intelligence services. In 1920, he established the Abbey of Delema, a religious commune in Cephalus, Sicily, where he lived with various followers. His libertine lifestyle led to denunciations in the British press, and the Italian government evicted him in 1923. He divided the following two decades between France, Germany, and England, and continued to promote his religion until his death. The Book of Necronomicon, dedicated to Alistair, mentions that necromantic magic has caused changes in the consciousness for, you know, those who were most intimately involved with it. Therefore, it undertakes the principle of facing all the fears and darkness that resides within to reach the light and spirit within the soul. Alistair believed sincerely in the existence of magic, to the point where he performed Enochian magic to make himself invisible. He's even stated that apparently once upon a time a vampire attacked him, which, excuse me? I would like to know more about that. 
Alrighty, now to get into some fun mysteries. How about we start off with a werewolf? So The Werewolf of Bedburg, a tale that weaves through the fabric of the 17th century, is a chilling narrative that transcends the boundaries of mere folklore. At its core is Peter Stubby, a seemingly upstanding member of society, a wealthy farmer, a widower, and a father to two offspring. Yet beneath this facade lies a creature of the night, a werewolf with an insatiable appetite for humid redness and a penchant for unspeakable horrors. Peter's alleged crimes are not for the faint of heart. The laundry list of atrocities include taking schmexual advantage of people, hurting folks in the same vein, the gruesome act of ripping spawn from pregnant women, and the um, rope necklacing of small humans, and also the raw consumption of innocent lambs and calves. I apologize if any of that verbiage confused you. The interwebs don't like me talking about icky criminal acts, but if we're going to ignore history, then we're doomed to repeat it. So I'm doing the best I can here. If you have questions, I'm sure somebody in the comments can help you out. The depths of his depravity reached their peak with the horrific mass killing of his own family, a monstrous act that involved impregnating his daughter, killing his son, and then devouring the young one's brains. Sheesh. The community that once held him in high regard as a two-faced, empathetic widower now recoiled in horror as the true nature of Peter was unveiled. The werewolf of Bedburg was not just a mythical creature in the shadows, it was a very real madness that had infiltrated the fabric of daily life. The climax of this tale, as with many stories of its kind, is the capture and execution of the monstrous perpetrator. Peter met his end, and the echoes of his gruesome deeds reverberated through, you know, history books. This harrowing narrative has persisted over centuries, retold and adapted, capturing the collective imagination of, well, everybody. This werewolf stands not only as a tale of horror, but as a reminder that things are kind of scary out there, we don't know everything, and that's my nightmare fuel right there. Ready to hang out in the 1600s for a minute? Me too! Let's go back in time together. The Drummer of Tedworth, a tale hailing from the depths of the 1600s, unfolds like a spectral melody resonating through the corridors of Wiltshire's haunted history. Picture this, a mysterious drummer, unseen but omnipresent, wandering through the streets of Tedworth, drumming not just a rhythmic beat, but an unsettling demand for money. Sounds like every freak show I've been at ever. In the midst of this spectral drumming, a man named John Mompesson, perturbed by the relentless rhythms, decides to take matters into his own hand. He has the drummer apprehended, his drum confiscated, until he confesses to the alleged fraud of his actions. The paranormal percussionist, once detained, vanishes from the scene upon his release, leaving behind an eerie quiet that precedes an even stranger turn of events. As Mom Pesson embarks on a journey to London, a trip meant to provide respite, his family becomes the unwilling audience to a haunting encore. The air is pierced by the unmistakable sounds of drumming, loud and relentless, echoing through the walls of their home. The drummer, once a tangible figure, transforms into an ethereal presence, playing his spectral beats in the dead of night. First recorded in a pamphlet in 1678, the story of the drummer of Tedworth has endured the test of time, weaving its way into the fabric of occult discussions. Whether regarded as a piece of historical mystery or dismissed as a mere legend, the tale of the haunted drum and its ghostly percussionist persists, a mysterious echo from a bygone era that refuses to be silenced. See, I promised y'all actual mysteries today. Alrighty, we're gonna end this entire list with a tale from biblical times. So how was that for a history lesson? The Witch of Endor, a mysterious figure embedded in the ancient tapestry of the Hebrew Bible, emerges in the book of 1 Samuel 28, a chapter that plunges us into the realm of the supernatural. So, picture this. King Saul, facing imminent battle and devoid of his trusted seer Samuel, turns to this mystical practitioner for guidance, a desperate grasp at the threads connecting the living and the dead. Saul's quest for insight, his yearning for a conduit to the spirit world, leads him to the Witch of Endor. It's a moment steeped in desperation, a king seeking answers beyond the veil of the tangible. The encounter unfolds and the revelation is chilling, a proclamation of Saul's impending defeat, a destiny sealed in the threads of the spiritual fabric. This occult liaison catapults the Witch of Endor into the realms of necromancy and spiritualism. In the intricate mosaic of various occult practices and modern paganism, she becomes a symbol, a psychic medium representing the land surrounding Israel. The questions that arise from her tale delve into the moral quandaries of her actions, probing the delicate threads that bind the living to the ethereal. The Witch of Endor's story, a kaleidoscope of interpretation, weaves its way through the chapters of history, each retelling adding nuances to the intricate dance between the realms. It's more than a narrative. It's a philosophical exploration of the intersection between the living and the dead, a contemplation of the morality embedded in the pursuit of supernatural knowledge. As we unravel the layers of her tale, we confront the enduring power of occult witchcraft and the intricacies of the spiritual realm. The Witch of Endor, a spectral figure from the ancient past, beckons us to contemplate the unseen forces that shape our world, leaving us with more questions than answers. 
a perpetual mystery echoing through the corridors of time. Number 5. The Pyramids and the Sphinx Famed for giving out riddles to passers-by and would-be kings and keeping even more secrets for itself, the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids of Giza aren't just one of the best tourist destinations in the world, they're a source of never-ending speculation. Were they crafted by aliens? Are there hidden secrets lying within the Sphinx that we don't know about? Almost certainly. Let's dissect them a bit. So the Sphinx, if you haven't heard of it, this is your first time hearing about it. It's one of the seven wonders of the world or something, but this might be the first time. It's a massive limestone statue with a lion's body and let's be real, it's a nice one at that and the head of a human. Was it always a human's face? There's some speculation and discussion about that. Some researchers have proposed that originally the Sphinx was a monument to the jackal god Anubis, and that his face was refitted at some point in the image of Anamet II, a pharaoh from around that era. Now the purpose and origin remains a point of contention to Egyptologists. What was the Sphinx built for? Is it a tomb? A monument? Just something to take photos of? Some people even speculated that the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. A tomb? A monument? Just something to do? Researchers too have speculated that perhaps the Sphinx is older than Egypt even. Erosion pattern on the Sphinx's body appear consistent with water erosion, rather than wind erosion, raising all sorts of questions about the climate and geological history. Did Egypt used to be like a lot wetter? And that's just what puzzles people on the outside. The inside of the thing is a whole other can of worms. Some propose that there are unexplored passages or secret chambers containing wondrous treasures, ancient texts, sacred artifacts. I think the Master Sword might even be in there. Some people think there's proof of extraterrestrial life. It's a very widespread conspiracy theory that aliens were involved in the Sphinx and the pyramids and are very closely tied to ancient Egyptian culture. Some limited excavations around the Sphinx have been carried out, but because of the delicate nature of the monument, further digging is a bit uh, challenging. You don't want to be the guy who ruined one of the seven wonders of the world. They're going to make fun of you forever if that happens. We could do a whole video on the mysteries behind the Sphinx, and I sincerely hope we do because we are just scratching the surface of strange stuff going on there. But if you're looking for way more strange stuff, then you already know we have that in spades. We've got just about everything freaky you can think of. We've done a video or two on it. So hit subscribe. Please hit that little bell as well so you make sure to get our videos up to date. Don't miss a single screen, but do that at the end of this video because I got four more unsolved mysteries for you coming up right now. Number four, the Voynich Manuscript. The manuscript is one of my personal favorite unsolved mysteries out there just for how sheer little we know about it. We have nothing. It's kind of a choose your own adventure for mysteries. Is it aliens? Demons? A really convoluted historical prank? If you don't know, the Voynich Manuscript is a a strange document written in a handwritten text filled with bizarre illustrations. No one's been able to make sense of it, primarily because it's written in a language that has never been seen elsewhere in human history. It was named after Wilfred Voynich, the Polish antiquarian who purchased it in 1912, although its ownership has passed through many hands. So what was it written for, and by who? These are the questions we've been asking and we're probably going to keep asking over and over. The manuscript is about 240 pages, containing illustrations of plants, astronomical diagrams, humanoid figures, and other strange objects. Despite countless attempts by cryptographers, no one's been able to crack the code just yet. Some speculation has been made that it could be a biology textbook in an encoded language. Some people think it could be the scrawlings of a brilliant alchemist, magic and spell casting we couldn't possibly hope to understand. Some say it's from a forgotten civilization, while others have said maybe it's all just a load of nonsense and it's just made by someone who had too much much time on their hands and a vengeance against historians who wanted to prank them for centuries. The book is thought to have come from anywhere between the 15th century and the 17th century. We don't even know when this thing was written. Like I said, we know next to nothing about it. Now if you're feeling clever and inspired, you can find a PDF of the Voynich manuscript as a free download pretty easily. Who knows? You might be the one to finally crack this case. But hey, don't be frustrated if you end up falling down a conspiracy rabbit hole many before you have tried. I looked through a few of these pages and it took me 30 seconds before I was looking like Charlie from Always Sunny at the conspiracy wall, all that red tape and stuff. Number three, the Yonaguni Monument. You've heard of the lost city of Atlantis, surely. Of course you have. It's one of the best Disney movies you forgot about. That's a story for a whole other video. Well, what if it wasn't the only lost underwater city out there? Have you ever heard of the Yonaguni Monument? The Yonaguni Monument has sometimes been called Japan's Atlantis, and it refers to a strange, eerie underwater rock formation just off the coast of Yonaguni Island in Japan that has had people scratching their heads for years. 
It's a massive structure consisting of several flat rock slabs arranged in a way that seems like an intelligent life put it together. Now, some people say that this structure could be completely natural, resulting from years of erosion and tectonic activity. Certainly, stranger things have happened, and it wouldn't be completely impossible for something to form this way. But the way it exists now, the way it sits, it seems deliberately carved out. And it seems like it was an important structure to someone. Perhaps a monument, a temple, some sign of a lost city, hence the Atlantis comparisons. Is it possible this was evidence of a lost civilization buried beneath the ocean waves, forever forgotten to history? The monument being completely submerged has been fuel for the fire of speculation. Was it always underwater? Did it end up there over time? Did the water raise around it? Did the land used to look significantly different? It makes it pretty difficult to study as well, making it just that little bit more elusive, as if it wasn't mysterious enough as is. But let's be real, it was probably aliens. It was almost certainly aliens. Number two, the Bermuda Triangle. Ah, the Bermuda Triangle. Now there's an exquisite ancient mystery. One of the certified classics. Something that's eluded us for years and will probably continue to do so. It's been referred to before as the Devil's Triangle, and it's host to all manner of mysterious incidents and unexplained phenomena. One of the more infamous incidents linked to the Bermuda Triangle is the disappearance of Flight 19 in December 1945. Five Navy bombers vanished during a routine training mission alongside 14 crew members members. Gone. Zilch. There was an extensive search effort, but nothing was ever found. Not so much as a bolt off the hull, a boot fished up, a hat, nothing. It was as if they were swallowed up by the void. Naturally, people went a bit wild with theories on this one. Anything from aliens, electromagnetic anomalies, alternate realities, no clipping into the back room. You know, pretty serious academic stuff. But it's bizarre. Another particularly good Bermuda baffler for you is the case of the USS Cyclop. In March 1918, the 542 foot long cargo ship carrying over 300 crew members vanished during its voyage from Barbados. No wreckage, no survivors ever found. Certainly you would think a ship that big with that many people would leave behind a little bit of evidence, right? What happened? Were they swallowed up by the very seas themselves, pulled to Davy Jones's locker by the Kraken? Or are they somewhere we can't reach them, in a place between worlds and time? The region is known for all sorts of weird stuff too, involving electronic malfunctions and compass deviations. It makes it seem like there is just something bad in the air out there. Maybe just bad vibes? Certainly seems that way. And number one, the Dorset Mass Grave. Oh, this one is a doozy, and it is one of the scariest and most confusing archaeological discoveries ever found. Let me ask you, what's more fun than a barrel of monkeys? A barrel of Vikings? Well, how about a mass grave full of headless Viking bodies? No? Well, you and I find different things fun, I suppose. Way back in the yesteryear of 2008, a group of archaeologists were on a fairly routine digging operation in Dorset, a quaint little seaside town in England. They were supervising a digging operation to improve local roads and were on set to see if there was anything of note to find, you know, if they came across an old coin or an old arrowhead or something you can stuff in a museum case. For the first few days of the job, there wasn't anything particularly noteworthy discovered until they came across the mass pile of 54 entangled Viking corpses all missing their heads. I guess they thought that was probably kind of interesting. If it was just a, you know, a bunch of headless Viking bodies, that'd be one thing. But the mass grave was wrapped in confusing details. Their skulls were missing, but as well their rib cages, arms, and leg bones were all scattered around, this is disgusting, surrounded by discarded teeth. No clothes or weaponry was recovered. So what in the Allfather's name happened here, because absolutely nothing I can imagine is pleasant. Sounds like Vikings opened up a portal to hell, went really wild with it. The teeth found around the grave had all been filed down neatly, which is very interesting. Now, it goes without saying that Viking dental surgery could not have been painless, meaning the process had to be excruciating, suggesting it was either done by a very careful tormentor or done to themselves to intimidate their opponents to show just how gritty they are. I actually don't know which of those two are preferable. They actually both sound pretty horrible. Now, as good as my theory about a bunch of Vikings opening up a portal to hell and being offered as a sacrifice is, archaeology 
anthropologists had some different ideas. They theorized that by looking at the wound patterns on the ribs and torso, they were surgical precise blows, which wasn't really the kind of thing you'd expect from a rabid viking warrior flailing around a sword in a brawl. The archaeologists thought that these men were either offered up as part of a horrifyingly sadistic ritual, or it was a big time mass sentencing where everybody was sentenced to the death. Explains too where all the weapons and gear had gone, these men had been brought here from somewhere else and then left here for a long long, long time. We might never know the truth behind the doors at Massgrave, and I'm gonna be honest, that might be fine with me. Some secrets are better left buried. Anyone else feel though that all those Viking skeletons, that might be like the world's most terrifying puzzle to put all that together? Morbid thought, not something to end the video on. Number five, the Dark Watchers. California is off considered one of the most beautiful states. It's got gorgeous mountains, lush beaches, sunny days, it's practically a paradise. But behind sun-streaked sands at the peaks of the Santa Lucia Mountains, lies a dark secret. A mysterious group of shadowy beings watching over the people below. The locals call them Los Vigilantes Oscuros. Los Vigilantes Oscuros, or the Dark Watchers, were first reported during the 18th century by Spanish settlers who arrived there. The stories would describe these tall, featureless specters that would appear for a moment serving as a warning before someone's imminent disappearance. It was the last thing you'd ever see. Now these creatures towered over mortals and looked human enough, but were any but. They stood 10 to 12 feet tall and were said to be draped in cloaks or capes and wore large brimmed hats like that of a witch. Folklore and oral stories describe these creatures as sternly observing, watching over on high and seemingly only pursuing those who disturb them. But it is said that those who approach these figures vanish into oblivion, never seen again, not even leaving behind a footprint. So what are they? With hundreds of years worth of reports and sightings, surely someone must have some guess as to what scary shadow people are watching you in the mountains. Now the prevailing and admittedly kind of dull theory is that the dark watchers are a symptom of pareidolia, a very common psychological phenomenon in which the human brain attempts to seek out patterns that it recognizes in something weird. It's why our brain often fills in strange details in the sky. If we see something up there, we can see a flying saucer kind of because we want it to be a flying saucer, you know? Our brain fills in the details we think we see. Encounters of dark watchers could just be the shadows of swaying trees or creatures darting about in the night and tired eyes mistaking it for something else. But this video is about unsolved paranormal mysteries and it's more likely this might be a paranormal phenomenon for which there is no comfortable scientific or reasonable explanation. These creatures through the veil exist in a way I just can't understand. So perhaps it's best for now that we follow their example and you know what? We just watch. We just observe, we take nothing but photos, we leave footprints, I think that's how it goes, and we keep watching Top 5 Scary. The shadow people told me to say that. It's actually crazy, the shadow people also told me that their one wish is they want for you guys out there to like, like and comment and subscribe and hit that little bell to make sure you get all the videos that we put out. It's weird that they were so specific with their orders, but that's, <laughs> I'm just relaying what they told us. So keep on watching Top 5 Scary, but do all that subscribing business at the end of this video, because otherwise you're gonna miss the rest of the California mysteries I got for you. Number four, the ghost of Hollywood. The Hollywood sign is probably one of the most iconic landmarks on the west coast. Instantly you see that and you know you're in La La Land. But did you know it might be haunted by the spirit of a Hollywood starlet who took her life years ago? Beneath the monument to Tinseltown's glitz and glamour lies a dark secret that perhaps would be better left buried. Peg Entwistle was a young actress and a Hollywood hopeful who had a dream like many before her to come to Hollywood and become a household name making it big on the silver screen. She had a small career on Broadway and then traveled to California to make it in the pictures and landed a role in a picture 13 women. Now by the time the film had premiered to test audiences her role was cut almost entirely down to 12 women causing her to fall into a depression. The film released and was neither a commercial or critical hit. Despondent and Twistle thought there was no hope for her. On September 16th 1932 she left her home to climb the Hollywood sign and cast herself off of the H to the hiking trail below. Now since since then, hikers and visitors to Hollywood's famous landmark have reported strange occurrences around the tourist spot. Hikers claim they can smell strange perfume in the air, thought to be Peggy's favorite. Joggers sometimes claim they see an ethereal woman in 1930s with a sad expression walking down the trail. That could also just be Lana Del Rey though. One park ranger, John Arbogast, claims he sees her almost nightly whenever it's 
too foggy. Sees her sitting, brooding, forever trapped in the place she could never make her dreams happen. This does give me an idea though, maybe a little way to solve everybody's problems. Maybe somebody makes a movie about the ghost and the Hollywood sign and then instead of blowing your budget on special effects, you ask her to play the ghost, she gets to star in a big movie, you get to make a movie about ghosts, she might pass on, everybody wins. Win, 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 win. Just make sure if you make that movie, I produce that, okay? So keep me in the credits. Number three, the Queen Mary. Now this next one is a beloved tourist spot. It's one of the most famous ships in the country and there are few ships in the United States even half as haunted as the Queen Mary. A decommissioned ship that was converted into a hotel in Long Beach, California. It's stately, it's lush, it's got all the comfort and modern amenities of being a navy man, bursting with restless spirits. The ship was christened in the mid 30s by the Queen Mary herself. That's why, that's why they named her that. And it was retired three decades later. It's since been converted into a hotel where guests can go and rent out a stateroom and pretend they're crossing the Atlantic in style. Now, there are a variety of spots inside the Queen Mary that are said to be congregation points for all things supernatural and strange. Perhaps if you know already anything about the Queen Mary, the most famous is Stateroom B340. Now, this was a problem before the place was even haunted. In 1948, a passenger, Walter J. Adamson, passed away in the room under unknown conditions. Nothing really came of this event until 1966 when a woman who was staying in B340 reported that she was woken up when the bed covers were pulled away and she saw a spectral man standing at the foot of her bed and it was no room service. She screamed and rang for a steward but as soon as the steward arrived to assess the situation the man had vanished. Now guests staying in this room claim they hear someone knock at the door in the middle of the night. The Mary's maids too complain that they find water running in B340 when no one's been in it in days. People have reported all kinds of ghosts around the pool as well. There's a woman in an old wedding gown people say they see, a young boy in a suit, a cloud of steam appearing out of nowhere, and then a girl in a blue and white dress who disappears in an instant. Or maybe it's a gold and black dress, I'm not sure. Whatever the case, there's so many ghosts up in the Queen Mary, it's definitely worth checking out if you've got an EMF reader in your suitcase when you're going to California. Number two, Griffith Park. Now if you're a real avid cinephile, a student of the silver screen, perhaps you'd recognize Griffith Park for its use in a ton of Hollywood productions. The sprawling, rugged, mountainous set is home to a lot more than memorabilia for Hollywood. It's also said to be home to spirits and haunted by a century old curse. It's said to have started all the way back in 1863 when Dona Petronilla, the niece of land baron Don Antonio Feliz, was cut out of her will. She was spurned and placed a hex on his land and cursed him for this indignation. She vowed that the land would never turn a profit for him and that as long as he lived there, he would suffer misfortune until his untimely death and anyone who was stupid enough to own the land afterward would get the same treatment. Now local historians say the man who negotiated the ranch's rights was slain in a saloon duel and the land's new owner was fatally struck by bandits in Mexico, so not looking good. A wealthy industrialist would end up buying up 4,000 acres of the land in the 1880s, but he ended up donating the land to the city of LA after strife and all sorts of malfeasances were causing problems with his ownership. He ended up striking his wife in a rampage. Now, she survived, but he went to prison for two years and passed away almost immediately after his release. Pretty suspicious, pretty strange. The landowners all died in rags, their reputation tarnished, and now that it's LA property, Property, Griffith Park wasn't making anyone particularly rich. Was Donna Petronilla's curse that effective or just a series of sheer coincidences? There are some who say Donna still watches over the land, ensuring her vengeance is carried out forever. Some visitors to Griffith Park claim that they see her spirit haunting the ground. Her vengeful ghost is said to appear as a lady in an all white dress who materializes before locals for a moment. And number one, Mount Shasta. Standing nearly 15,000 feet in the air, Mount Shasta is a beautiful peak. And if you believe the legends, it could be home to some of the strangest thing in the entire country. Really just about every conspiracy theory out there has been leveled to this mountain at one point. We got UFO sightings, strange disappearances, paranormal hauntings, a lost city, lizard people. If there is a conspiracy about something
something strange happening in California, the odds are good it'll eventually reach Mount Shasta. It's even true of GTA 5. You look up Mount Iliad, there's so many weird mysteries going on there. Virtual real, it's everywhere. The history of mystery at Sh oh, the history of mystery. That rolls off the tongue beauty. The history of mystery. I'm going to say that like 12 times. Sorry, editor. The history of mystery at Shasta goes back pretty far to the indigenous roots of the area. For the indigenous groups there, the mountain is a sacred place, sharing the territories of the Shasta, Wintu, Achimawai, Atsugewi, and Modoc, who all date their lineage back to when the mountain still erupted. Oh, it was a volcano. I kind of slid that under the door, but this thing used to like shoot lava. To the Modoc people, the mountain is home to the Gamakma, the creator in their stories, and where the original bones of the Modoc people were first placed. Some observers still bring offerings to the mountain and to the old gods who are thought to reside over there. Tales of mythical creatures like Sasquatch are fairly common around the area and have been for years too, but like I said, that is just the tip of all the weirdness that's going on out here. One of the more interesting mysteries, and definitely the one I find most interesting, come out of Shasta is that of a lost city. There are some who speak of Lemuria, a theorized continent believed to have sunk over the Indian or Pacific Ocean. Theorists claim that some people survived this catastrophe and now the Lemurians live below Mount Shasta, presumably waiting until they can come and take over the earth or maybe they're just chilling with advanced technology. Who's to say? This is where the lizard people come in because these there are people who believe that the Lemurians are actually the fabled lizard people. They live under Mount Shasta and this is where they come to have meetings about what rap stars they're going to endorse to control the Illuminati. Of course, there's also the claims of UFO sightings. One particular flying saucer seen in February 2020 made rounds when a cloud in the sky looked exactly like a flying saucer. Copy in Jordan Peele's nope. Officials denied it as just a lenticular cloud, but hey, take a look and decide for yourself because it's definitely odd. So Mount Shasta, nothing but a good trail to hike up? Or is it a home to a series of mysteries bubbling and bursting just waiting to erupt? Number five, the original Night Stalker. The original Night Stalker, or as he's better known, the Golden State Killer Cold Case, is one of the most infamous and complex criminal investigations in recent memory. For over 40 years, the identity of the Golden State Killer remained a mystery as he committed a series of brutal crimes, assaults, and burglaries across California in the 1970s and 1980s. Now, for decades, this case was pretty open and was only closed in recent years around 2018 when Joe Joseph James D'Angelo, a former police officer, was identified as a suspect through DNA evidence. D'Angelo was arrested and charged with 13 counts of murder and numerous other heinous crimes, bringing a small sense of closure to the victim's families and a reminder of why to never give up on an unsolved case. The Golden State Killer case also highlights the power of DNA in solving cold cases because it was the use of a public DNA database that allowed investigators to link DNA from the crime scenes to a distant relative of D'Angelo, which ultimately led to his identification and arrest. This particular breakthrough actually sparked a renewed interest in the use of genetic genealogy and criminal investigations with many other cold cases being re-examined in light with this similar technique. The whole case as well also showcases the importance of agency cooperation and the need for continued efforts to share information and resources between law enforcement agencies. This case involved jurisdictions across California and it was only because they all came together to all work on the same goal that they were able to solve it. Now while the arrest and conviction of Joseph James D'Angelo does provide a little bit of closure to the victim's families. It is also a stark reminder of the many, many unsolved cases across the country and the need for continued efforts to bring justice to victims and closure to their families. And if you're looking for more cold cases, true crime, mysteries, cryptids, we have just about all of that and then some on Top 5 Scary. Basically anything freaky under and above the sun you can think of, we've done a video or two on. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that bell, but hey, please. Do that at the end of this video, because I got more freaky cold cases for you coming right out. Number four, the Lady of the Dunes. The Lady of the Dunes is the nickname given to an unidentified victim whose body was discovered in the sand dunes near Provincetown, Massachusetts in 1974. The woman was estimated to be between 25 and 40 years old and her body showed signs of a brutal attack, including being nearly decapitated and having her hands severed. For 50 years, this woman's identity was completely unknown, a true Jane Doe and a tragically forgotten case. 
Now over the years there have been numerous leads and potential subjects and all sorts of wild claims all trying to help in their own way including claims that the victim was an extra in the movie Jaws which was being filmed in the area at the time. There's actually more evidence for that than a not. In recent years though advancements in DNA technology have kind of renewed hope for this case. In 2010 a woman came forward claiming to have seen a man carrying a shovel in the area where the body was discovered. The woman was able to provide a a composite sketch of the man and DNA was later extracted from a hair found in the victim's hand that matched a family member of the potential suspect. Eventually, Forensic studies of the bones would reveal the identity of our mystery Jane Doe was a woman named Ruth Marie Terry. Now the Lady of the Dunes case is a haunting reminder of the many unidentified victims, but there are so many countless others who don't. It's another reminder much like the Golden State one that even if a case has been on ice for years and years and years, eventually technology will catch up and as long as someone keeps pushing on a case, eventually these cases will get solved and bring just a tiny bit of closure to the victim's family. Number 3. Christy Mirak The Christy Mirak case is a decades long unsolved true crime that shook the small community of Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1992. Mirak was a 25 year old teacher who was brutally beaten and assaulted in her home while getting ready for work which would lead to her death. Despite extensive investigations and DNA evidence collected from the crime scene, this case would remain unsolved for over 25 years, where it would remain on ice tucked away in a back folder until 2018, when investigators used the technology, genetic genealogy, which we mentioned before, to identify one Raymond Rowe, a local disc jockey better known as DJ Freeze as the perpetrator behind the crime. We explained it a little bit before, but I kind of glossed over it. Genetic genealogy works by by uploading a suspect's DNA to a public genealogy database, which then searches for genetic matches among millions of people who've uploaded their own DNA. Think of it kind of like a DNA Google. In Rowe's case, investigators found a match through his second cousin's DNA, which ultimately led to his arrest. Isn't that a little bit interesting how many of these cases it ended up being they could track it through someone who was related to the suspect? I just find that fascinating. Rowe eventually pleaded guilty to the killing of Christy Mirak, bringing a small sense of closure to her family and the Lancaster community. This case was one of the first successful uses of genetic genealogy in a criminal investigation and has since sparked a renewed interest in solving other cold cases like some of the ones we've mentioned here actually. Here's hoping that technology can keep being put forward for more cold cases and we can solve as many of them as possible. Number 2. Linda Pagano In 2014, a reddit user going by the name Call Me Ice shared a story about an unidentified set of bones that was lying in a cemetery in Strongsville, Ohio. This user was researching another cold case at the time, clearly a hobbyist, and while searching for genealogy records came across this Jane Doe skeleton and was fascinated by it, wondering why there was never an effort made to identify who the bones belonged to. Wishing to right an ancient wrong, the user posted to the subreddit Unresolved Mysteries in the hopes of crowdsourcing some answers. The Strongsville Jane Doe, as she was known, was first found in 1975 by three people who were exploring a nearby forest. They found a skeleton lying on a sandbar, mostly intact but missing some of its jaw. The bones were reported and it was found to belong to a woman estimated aged 18 to 25 who'd suffered a fatal gunshot five months before being discovered. Police checked her across several missing women cases but were unable to make any connections and the trail went cold until 2014 when reddit started to look into it. Eventually the original poster got in touch with the cemetery and managed to get access to original autopsy files including a photo of the skull. It was sent to a digital artist and nothing much happened until in 2016 the forensic artist who had done the reconstruction came across a listing on the National Missing and Unidentified Person System or NAMIS of a woman named Linda Pagano who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances around 1974. Linda had come home from a concert and gotten into an argument with her stepfather and supposedly left to go visit her mother. This was the last time anyone had ever seen Linda Pagano. The forensic artist then contacted the medical examiner's office and pulled Linda's dental records, matching Linda Pagano to the Strongsville Jane Doe, solving the mystery. 
Now, the identity of the attacker was never found, with some suspecting that it was her stepfather, but the family was able to find the smallest closure in knowing what became of Linda, and it never would have happened without a Reddit post. It's inspiring in a small way to know that sometimes when law enforcement agencies can't finish the job or can't close a case, that there are people out there who are willing to open source it. Keep that in mind for this similar case, also solved by the internet. Number one, the Grateful Doe. The Grateful Doe is a notable missing persons case, a heartbreaking and mysterious cold case that baffled investigators for decades. This case began in 1995, when a young man was tragically killed in a car accident on Interstate 95 in Virginia. He was believed to be in his early 20s, but had no identification of any kind on him at the time of the accident. The only clues anyone had for his identity was that he was wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt and had Grateful Dead tickets in his back pocket and was on the road in a van. And so people assumed he was probably going to see the Grateful Dead, leading to the sobriquet Grateful Doe. Despite extensive efforts to identify the young man, including releasing sketches and posting information on missing persons databases and Grateful Dead fan forums just in case anybody was plotting to link up with him, he remained unidentified for two decades, 20 years. In 2015, a breakthrough finally came through when a Redditor recognized the victim from a photo of him taken at a Grateful Dead concert in 95. The photo was posted by the victim himself, who had written that he was looking for a ride to the next concert following the dead on tour. With the help of the Reddit community and DNA testing, the victim was finally identified as one Jason Callahan, a 19 year old from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Callahan's family had reported him missing in 95, but they apparently were not aware of his interest in the Grateful Dead and had not connected him to the unidentified victim in Virginia. Now, the Grateful Doe case is another interesting one showing the power of the internet being used for good. The internet doesn't get used for good that often. It's nice to see the efforts of a determined group of online sleuths and hey, fans of the Grateful Dead, let's be real, helping to bring closure to a family who had been searching for over two decades. And like all these other cases, it just goes to show that a cold case is never truly closed until you actually get some answers for it. It took them two decades of nothing until leads basically landed right in their lap. Sometimes you just gotta wait for technology to catch up. Now, while the circumstances surrounding his death are a bit of a mystery still, the identification of him have allowed his family to have a little bit of rest and allow us to move on from this case. Number five on this list is the tattoo artist. In today's world, you don't always need to be a cop or investigator to solve crimes. With the internet and the fact that literally everything that we do is documented at all times, people are more than capable of solving a crime from the comfort of their own home. That's kind of what went down in this case. Ranker writes, Tattoo artist and 19th century antiques collector Greg May was murdered and it took a year for police and federal investigators to prove that he was dead. All they knew was that his former roommate had stolen his $70,000 collection. It wasn't until they were contacted by Ellen Leach, an e-detective who was trying to solve what she thought was a different murder with information about a severed head found in a bucket full of concrete. Once they got contacted by her, they were able to charge the ex-roommate with murder. So first off, this crime is absolutely horrifying. It's honestly the nature of this crime which has rocketed this internet case onto this list. Like if I actually start to try and imagine dying by a chainsaw, it just kind of makes me feel ill inside. And what's even more sick about this is that if it wasn't because of the internet, the killer would have got away with it. Ellen Leach, however, is a pro at doing what I suggested earlier, solving crimes from the comfort of her own home. She literally is an internet detective and has dedicated herself to the craft. From my findings, it seems that Ellen Leach has been instrumental in not only this case, but in solving seven other cases around the United States. That is a sizable amount of influence that Ellen's got, and a lot of families can thank her for doing what she does. I personally can't even imagine how taxing it must be sitting at your desk literally the entire day trying to find a chainsaw killer. Definitely not the sort of profession that I could do, but really happy that we've got people like Ellen out here that can. Number four on this list is the Hitman. Alright, so this case is honestly less terrible
terrifying and more just stupid if you ask me. If you're a hitman, then you have to be extremely discreet. After all, you're literally selling your services to a buyer who will want you to take the life of another human being. This obviously isn't even remotely close to being legal or morally right, and secrecy has got to be the name of the game. That's why it was absolutely ridiculous when a guy, actually unnamed, made a Facebook account to advertise his skills as a contract killer. He was smart enough to use a fake name, so he named this Facebook account Anthrax, but clearly this level of intelligence didn't translate to a visual medium. My dude literally used his own face in the photos of the profile. Well, obviously it didn't take very long before the police got wind of this and arrested this guy. They were able to do so before he was contracted to kill anyone and honestly never even found out if he was a real contract killer or just a loser in a basement trying to mess with people. Now what makes this story scary though is that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This was one dumb guy who posted stuff on Facebook and the Facebook community responded very quickly and took him down. But there are way more intelligent people than this guy in the world who are real and trained contract killers using the internet. Facebook, Craigslist, eBay, they've all seen people pose as other people and use their platform as a space for evil. These are also only the platforms that we're all familiar with. I've never seen I've never seen it for myself personally, but apparently the dark web has tons of sites where you can literally find reputable hitmen at the click of a button. The internet can occasionally be great and solve some crimes, but don't get it twisted, guys. The internet can also host those same crimes as well. Number three on this list is the Grateful Doe Hitchhiker. This is one of the most famous internet cases of all time. What culture says, in 1995, 21-year-old student Michael Hager picked up a 19-year-old hitchhiker traveling from a Grateful Dead concert. The two were making their way to their respective destinations, Hager to his mother's house in South Carolina, when something caused the Volkswagen transporting the men to crash into a tree. Both died. As Hager didn't know the boy who was riding with him, his family didn't know either. When they came to identify Hager's remains, none could identify the hitchhiker and nobody came out to report him missing. Since his real identity was unknown, he was given the name Grateful Doe because of the Grateful Dead concert. There were reconstructions made of Grateful Doe's face and a number of small distinctive tattoos that people could work to identify. However, for many years there was no luck until Australian Reddit user Layla Betts started posting about Grateful Doe online, leading to the creation of the subreddit Grateful Doe. Someone saw the posts and claimed that the reconstructions looked like his former roommate. That roommate was named James Callahan. With Callahan's photos beginning to circulate online, his mother came forward and revealed that her son had in fact gone missing 20 years earlier. The police were later able to confirm that Grateful Doe was in fact James Callahan. I think what makes this so scary is when you consider the perspective of the mother. Her son goes off to a concert and just literally never comes home ever. You can't call him, you can't email him, you, you have absolutely no way of knowing who he was with last. Like, that would have been pure mental agony for years. And as horrible as it sounds, probably the news that he died, that might have been a bit of a relief to her. Even though that's a horrible thought, at the very least, she can get closure and move on with her life. So at least we can thank the internet for that one. Number two on this list is the murder of Crystal Theobald. Crystal Theobald was taken from the world far too soon. Her family, obviously extremely distraught, would not rest until justice was served. What Culture writes, after Theobald was shot dead at age 24, her mother and cousin made a fake MySpace profile in her image. They used it to find the identities of a group of local gang members who they believed were involved in her killing, luring them in with Theobald's picture and then catfishing them in the messages. By doing this, they were able to eventually find the owner of the car that had been at the scene of her death, the people in the car, and the events leading up to the fatal shootout. Police weren't too happy with the family's amateur sleuthing, but in the end, they were able to find useful information. With the family's investigation, they were able to find who was responsible for Chris death and make some arrests and convictions, giving the family some of the closure that they needed. I can't even begin to comprehend how hard that process would have been for the family searching for their daughter's own killers. Also, it's a little questionable to me that the police weren't too happy with the amateur sleuthing. Like, I don't claim to know anything about investigating, and I will be the first one to admit that I am super ignorant towards the process and
and procedures in catching a killer. However, you would think that the police should be happy with the family, especially considering the only reason they ended up getting to the bottom of the crime was because of what the family did. I guess the family didn't really care what the police thought about it though, because they needed to find their daughter's killers. Thanks to the power of the internet, they were able to do so. And finally, number one on this list is Grandma's Code. This one is super eerie, and even though it comes to a happy ending, still a bit creepy. Jane's grandmother passed away from cancer over 20 years ago. Before she passed, she wrote this encoded note. She left it for her family, but didn't give them a code or anything like that to solve it. Obviously, if the family couldn't solve it for 20 years though, it was a pretty freaking hard puzzle. That's when, enter in, Reddit. Jana posted the encryption on Reddit. Reddit, and I kid you not, literally less than half an hour goes by and somebody solved it. It turned out that the encryption was actually a code for several prayers. Each letter stood for the first letter in a word in what would amount to a different prayers or messages to God. She didn't say anything crazy or anything like that, just a bunch of prayers to God as her final words. But what's insane and really creepy about this is she was basically talking to us from the grave. If you think about it, she sent this message 20 years ago while she was alive and we only received it right now. Pretty eerie if you ask me. Number five on this list is the case of Carolee Sadie Ashby. A horrible and scary case that took over 50 years to solve and was only ever solved due to the internet. What Culture writes, solving a mystery that's been plaguing a family for almost half a century can sometimes start with something as simple as a Facebook post and that's what just happened in solving a 1968 hit and run case. After going down to the shops on Halloween, four-year-old Carolee Sadie Ashby was hit by a drunk driver who didn't so much as stop to check on her. The case had haunted Russ Johnson of the Fulton Police Department for years, and no leads eventually led to the case to go cold. On retiring, he took a chance, posting details of the incident to a Facebook page that dealt with local history. From there, a woman reached out to him, and they had their first lead in decades. Decades. The woman used to live in the area and told Johnson about how local man Douglas Parkhurst had asked her to give him an alibi if the police were to speak to her. She explains that she rejected his request not knowing what he might be needing an alibi for, but secretly suspecting it could be related to Carolee's death. All those years later, the police department reopened the case and questioned Parkhurst again. Clearly, having a few decades to let his guilt stew had changed Parkhurst's outlook and he admitted to killing the girl, having been drinking that night before getting behind the wheel. This was 50 years removed and so the statute of limitation had changed and therefore Parkhurst actually couldn't even be charged. This was really sad for the family of this girl, obviously, but at the very least, they discovered who did it. This is super real and just so sad, honestly. A girl as young as that to be taken so soon and unexpectedly at the hands of a drunk driver. It's good to see the internet figure this one out, but the best case scenario would have been that it just never happened at all. Number four on this list is Sam Whitehorn. Okay, so I'll be honest guys, this one isn't quite as terrifying as some of the other ones on this list, but it really hit home with me, so it's making a list. I am a massive Green Bay Packers fan, have been for years, and will be for years to come. That team has already put me through so much emotion agony, but it seems that fellow Packers fan Sam Whitehorn got some physical agony instead. Sam was in Portland walking around with a Green Bay Packers beanie on. The altercation happened when several Seattle Seahawks fans approached him and started getting very aggressive. It escalated and they beat Sam senselessly, sending him to the ER. Just as quickly as they came though, they were gone, and with no idea who they were, it was impossible to direct the police to them. Well, Sam's girlfriend posted this story on the internet and it started making waves. So much so that the Green Bay Packers organization themselves stumbled upon it and used their resources to post it everywhere. To my knowledge, this led to the discovery of these men and ultimately their arrest. Sports is great fun and it's a roller coaster of a ride, but these guys took it to a place that it never should have gone. Number three on this list is the discovery of William Earl Moult. William Earl Moult was a man who lived in Florida back in the 90s. On November 7th, 1997, William went missing and it literally took 22 years before anyone found him. The case had gone completely cold and nobody had any idea what the heck happened to Will. Enter in the internet and Google Earth. A technology that literally wasn't even around back when William was alive was the thing that finally found him. William was found emerged in water in his vehicle behind some houses in Florida. 
Behind these houses in Florida, they have a backyard, and then a little bit behind that is just a tiny lake out back. It really isn't that far at all from the homes, but the water is mucky and gross. Barry Fay is the person who lives in the house that's closest to where William was found, and it was a neighbor to Barry who was on Google Earth when they spotted the car. The police went to go check it out, and sure enough, they found an extremely calcified car and the remains of William Earl Moult. He must have been driving down this road on the evening of November 7th, 7th, swerved into the lake and done so in a fashion that nobody recognized. It's impossible to say whether it was the crash that killed him or if he drowned in the lake or if he was already dead behind the wheel when he drove into the water. Either way, I think what's super scary about this case is the fact that this was literally behind someone's home. Really makes you wonder what sort of stuff do I have out back of my home that I haven't come across yet. Number two on this list is the Strongsville Skeleton. This is one where Reddit was able to get to the bottom of an icy cold cold case. What Culture writes, Lots of interesting things have been discovered on Reddit, but this really takes the cake. The website helped find the identity of a skeleton based on research that was carried out a decade before the birth of the internet. Back in 1975, a trio of boys found a skeleton in the woods of Strongsville, Ohio. They further noted that the body was that of a white woman in her early 20s, but that was about all they could gather. Fast forward a few decades, and a woman called Christina Skates began uploading her research into the case on Unsolved Mysteries, another popular amateur detective site called WebSooths. Thanks to her information and the images of the skull, an artist called Carl Kulpelman was able to put together a reconstruction of what the skeleton may have looked like when alive. The illustration ended up looking strongly similar to Linda Pagano, a woman who had been reported missing a year before the skeleton was discovered. DNA testing put this theory to task and it was confirmed that the unidentified remains could now be identified as Linda. I can't imagine being that family of Linda and hearing literally almost 50 years later that those remains found so many years ago was her. Also too, just the story of the boys stumbling upon the skeleton, like that's kind of creepy in its own right. It's still impossible to know who actually killed Linda, but being able to give the family some closure is still important nonetheless. And finally, number one on this list is the post-it note mystery. This one honestly really struck a chord with me and is truly terrifying. What Culture says, in 2015, Reddit user rbradbury1920 posted to a legal advice thread asking what people thought of his predicament. He kept finding post-it notes around his apartment and given that he lived alone, he figured that it must be his landlord leaving them when he wasn't in. This is a problem because usually you need to be alerted when your landlord is coming into your home, never mind if they plan on leaving things behind like cryptic notes. It became even more of a problem because it wasn't his landlord at all and suddenly the man was faced with the real mystery of who was coming into his house and leaving notes for him. A bunch of theories were floated, even including multiple personality disorder, but eventually one stuck. It was carbon monoxide poisoning causing him to forget that he had left himself notes. Sure enough, he installed a CO2 alarm and found that he was being slowly poisoned. If it weren't for the fellow user making the suggestion, that OP may have well ended up dead. Can you imagine being slowly poisoned and not knowing it at all? in your own home as well, where you're supposed to be safe. Then having that poison affect you so much that you're literally lying in this dreamlike state, forgetting everything that you do. This sounds like something written by the writers of Fight Club, honestly. It's just so creepy to me to think that someone can get to the point where they aren't even aware of their own actions anymore. Like, what if this is happening to me or you right now, and we just don't even know it, because we keep forgetting? Really creepy stuff. Jumping right into number five is the Mary Celeste. Formerly known as the Amazon, the Mary Celeste was an American merchant brigantine under the captaincy of Benjamin Spooner Briggs. In October of 1872, Briggs would captain the Mary Celeste and prepare for the boat's first voyage. Accompanied by his wife, Sarah, their young daughter, Sophia, and a crew of eight carefully selected men, Briggs would set course for Genoa, Italy on November 5th, carrying 1,701 barrels of booze. Days after their departure, another brigantine from Canada, the De Gracia, would set course for Gibraltar, following a similar route to the Mary Celeste. 
On December 4, 1872, the helmsman of the De Gracia reported that a strange vessel was heading unsteadily towards it from about 10 kilometers or 6 miles away. The unidentified ship's strange and erratic movements tipped off to the De Gracia's captain that something was wrong, and the Canadian brigantine would proceed with caution. As the mysterious ship drew close, members of the crew noticed that there was no one on it, and when it wouldn't respond to any signals sent to it from the De Gracia, two crew members would board the ship in order to investigate. It was at this point that the pair would find out that this mysterious empty ship was the Mary Celeste. The sails on the abandoned brig were set in poor condition, much of the rigging was damaged, ropes hung loosely over the sides, the compass was broken, a significant amount of water was found in the boat, and its only lifeboat was missing. However, all of the ship's cargo remained relatively intact. The two crewmates also found the ship's daily log in a cabin. Its final entry dated at 8 a.m. on November 25th, nine days earlier. The log places the Mary Celeste's last known position nearly 750 50 kilometers, which is 400 nautical miles, away. The De Gracia and its crew would split up in order to bring the Mary Celeste to their destination, Gibraltar, where they would sell the ship in order to be salvaged. The disappearance of the Mary Celeste's crew is a mystery to behold, as the remains of Captain Briggs, his family, and his crew have yet to be found to this day. And over those years, various theories and explanations have been made. Some say there was an accidental explosion caused by one of the barrels of alcohol aboard the ship. Water spouts damaging the ship is another theory. Pirate or even alien abduction. Personally, I think the crew may have taken the lifeboat deep into the ocean and perished while lost at sea. Make sure to comment below your own theories on the matter. Anyway, regardless of how it happened, the Mary Celeste acts as one of the earliest examples of the Bermuda Triangle's mysterious nature and highlights the dangers that comes with venturing into the unknown. Next up at number 4 is the Great Isaac K. Lighthouse. Constructed in the mid-19th century on a remote island in the Bahamas, the Great Isaac K. Lighthouse was a beacon of hope for any mariners trying to navigate the treacherous waters. It stood tall, proud, and bright, warning sailors of the rocks that lurked beneath the waves. The island it was on was desolate, only accessible by boat and inhabited by the keepers of the lighthouse, John and William. It was the keeper's job to make sure the beacon's light remained operational, while performing a fair share of arduous and difficult tasks in order to maintain the lighthouse. And I know, this is starting to sound a lot like the movie The Lighthouse, but this story ends a whole lot differently. On the fateful day of August 4th, 1969, shortly after a storm, a supply ship is scheduled to bring essentials for the keepers, such as food, toilet paper, and the like. However, when the ship arrives, it's met with an eerie silence. When the supply crew noticed that the lighthouse was strangely unlit, they immediately alerted authorities, and a search party was dispatched to the island. Upon arrival, the search party found the lighthouse deserted, and the island it rested on just as desolate. The only clues were some open doors and entries missing from the lightkeeper's log, which only left more questions than answers. Theories and rumors quickly began to circulate after the sudden disappearance, many claiming the two lightkeepers were taken by pirates or robbers. Some thought they were killed in a storm. But honestly, if I was stuck on a remote island taking care of a lighthouse, I'd probably find a way to disappear too. Though deep down, we already know who or rather what was to blame, the mysterious nature of the Bermuda Triangle. A year after the incident, the Great Isaac K. Lighthouse was made to be automated so that no other inexplicable disappearances could occur again, and John and William were never seen or heard from again after the incident, marking another unsolved mystery stemming from the Devil's Triangle. And at number 3 is the USS Cyclops. The USS Cyclops was one of four bulk cargo ships built for the United States Navy a few years before the beginning of World War I. It gets its namesake from the Cyclops, a race of one-eyed giants from Greek mythology. The whopping 542-foot collier set sail from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil on February 16, 1918, carrying a cargo of manganese ore bound for Baltimore, Maryland. It was due to arrive at its destination by the 13th of March. The ship, under the command of Lieutenant Commander George W. Worley, had a crew of 309 officers and men on board. The ship, having been built in 1910, was not on its first journey. In fact, this was a trip the boat had made many times before, and one its crew was very familiar with. However, there were a couple problems with the ship. One was that the ship was struggling with engine trouble after departing, and the other was that the ship was carrying too much cargo, leaving it to be overloaded. The crew did not see these issues glaring enough to delay their journey, and made their way through the Atlantic anyway. Time would fly, and the boat's journey seemed to be going as planned, the Cyclops being last seen by another vessel only four days before their date of arrival. Yet, there were no reports of the cargo ship reaching its intended destination of Baltimore. In fact, the ship was nowhere to be found, and contact with the rest of the US Navy and the world had been completely cut off. This was during World War I. The original assumption of most was that the USS Cyclops had been destroyed in combat. However, there was never a distress signal sent from the ship, nor were any remains found of the ship. 
Even after a thorough search of the area, it was last known to be, these remains were still not found. It had completely disappeared. Reports indicate that there was a violent storm around the area that the military vessel would have been a day after it was last seen. A common theory behind the USS Cyclops vanishing is that the terrible storm sank the boat, as it was already suffering from engine troubles and was overloaded with cargo. Though, that still doesn't explain the lack of any remains or signals sent by the crew. But the mystery doesn't end there. The same exact vanishing would happen to two of the Cyclops' sister ships, Proteus and Nereus, during World War II. They would both disappear without a trace like the Cyclops before them, both within the Bermuda Triangle. Speaking of World War II, is Flight 19 at our number two spot. Flight 19 is the codename of a training mission that would happen on December 5th, 1945. It was comprised of five bomber planes taken from the Naval Air Station Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Flight 19 was tasked with navigating a triangular route over the Atlantic, known as the navigation problem number one before returning to base. Weather conditions were reported to be clear skies and calm winds. Sounds simple enough, right? Think again. Because shortly after takeoff, radio transmissions from the five torpedo bombers indicated the pilots were disoriented. They claimed that they couldn't identify their location at all. The flight instructor at the time, Lieutenant Taylor, told the team that he believed that they were flying over the Florida Keys, an incorrect calculation that would send them off course and towards the Bermuda Triangle. Radio control would continue to try guiding the pilots back to base, but things started to go wrong when radio contact with Flight 19 suddenly came to a stop. I'm sure by now you know the story. A massive search and rescue operation was launched involving several aircrafts and ships, but no trace of Flight 19 was found. In fact, during the search for Flight 19, another aircraft vanished without a trace, adding to the mystery. Many blame the disappearance of Flight 19 on natural magnetic anomalies and unexpected storms. But the truth to where those 14 crew members on the training mission went remains unknown. With all these disappearances across the years, it begs the question of where all these boats and planes are disappearing to. Do you guys have any theories? Let me know in the comments. And topping it all off at number one is none other than the Ellen Austin. The Ellen Austin was a massive three-masted American ship schooner built in 1854. The vessel would regularly ply between London, England and New York, crossing through the Bermuda Triangle. It wouldn't be until 1881, during another London to New York trip, would the Ellen Austin and its crew come across another ship on the Atlantic. This unknown ship was seemingly adrift and unmanned, so the crew of the Ellen Austin boarded the abandoned ship to investigate. The crew found that the ship was in perfect condition, but completely empty, raising questions as to why it was abandoned in the first place. After this discovery, the crew of the Ellen Austin decided to split their crew and tow the ship in order to salvage it and make some extra money. During this towing, the two vessels were hit by an unexpected storm, separating them from each other. However, the Ellen Austin and the abandoned ship would find each other again. However, the abandoned ship was vacant once again. The crew of the Ellen Austin would try to tow the ship again, but much to their dismay, the same exact thing would happen. Big storm, the ship gets separated, and the crew is completely gone, with the ship still intact. And before they could find the ship again, what little was left of the Ellen Austin's crew would depart hastily, in fear of this cursed, abandoned ship. This mysterious ship and its disappearing crew members quickly became a legend of the Bermuda Triangle, as reports of seeing the same abandoned ship were made, not only years, but centuries later, still in perfect condition. The true origins of this mysterious ship remain unknown, but it is said that the ship is an embodiment of the Bermuda Triangle's curse, vanishing any seafarer that tries to board it. But honestly, it's got nothing on any of the crazy pirates you see in Pirates of the Caribbean, so there's that.